so this is a much heavier lecture. <clears throat> this is the meat and potatoes of the muscular system. I'm obviously going to encourage you to, to watch this or listen to this more than one time. Here we're dealing with more of the actual um, contraction and the physiology side. So neurons and muscles are excitable. They respond to external stimuli by changing resting membrane potential. Um, and the change acts as a signal called action potential. And so everything we talk about in here is going to deal with um, muscle contraction, muscle activity. So everything today is going to focus on how myofilaments, which are called actin and myosin, slide past each other as the circuits contract. So you can see the definition. During contraction, the thin actin, it's going to be really important to remember which is which, the thin slide past the thick. And so the actin slides past the, the myosin so that they overlap to a greater degree than when they are at rest. But the length of the actin and myosin don't actually change themselves. Um, take a minute and look back from lecture one, right, at, we start with our gross anatomy, um, where you have the muscle attaches, right, you have the muscle, big fat part, the muscle belly, um, and then it breaks it down, starting with the gross anatomy, so we have our epimyceum, that's the outer covering, and then we get our bundle of fibers covered by the endomyceum, and then we get to start looking at um, one muscle fiber covered by the endomyceum, um, and we need to make sure that we understand that when we get down to that um, single muscle fiber, right, that we know all those parts. So you have the sarcolemma, which is the cell membrane, um, and then the filling is called um, sarcoplasm. And we have these channels, right, that run through it, um, so called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And they store the calcium we're going to really talk about today. And you can see in the picture that we're going to be looking at a myofibril. Um, myofibrils run the length of the, of the fiber. There's like hundreds of them in one muscle fiber. They're made of chains of sarcomeres, and they link end to end. And these are going to be um, where you find your actin and myosin, and they're going to what be what allows for the shortening. Right. So actin being your thin, myosin being the thick. Right. And you've got all sorts of parts going on here. So we've got, when you look at this picture, you can see these bands, okay? So we have our sarcolemma, there's your um, cell membrane, right? You can see the myofibrils, right? And they're going to run that length. Um, and you can see the T tubule, which runs the other way, the transverse to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so that's your nerve impulse. And then you see these bands in these zones, and you need to remember that um, the striations are repeating dark, which are your A, and light, which are your I bands, um, along the, the length of that myofibril. And then you have a dark midline of each I band, known as a Z disc. And between those Z discs is the sarcomere, the smallest contractile unit of the fiber. So we've got to make sure that we get that review of these parts here. Um, and contraction is the activation of the myosin cross bridges. Okay? So contraction is really getting the, the myosin cross bridges to activate it, how we make it go. So what you see here is a fully relaxed sarcomere. So a sarcomere at rest, you have both kind of that nice um, microscopic view, the micro view, and then you have kind of our, our digitized version so that you can take a look at how these 
bands and zones work and what it looks like at rest. So here you can see the thin and the thick, um, they overlap only slightly at the end of the A-band. And so looking at the A-band, there's only a slight um, kind of connection there, but, but they, they aren't joined, okay? They aren't joined. Um, here you can see three important points. So your calcium intracellular, so inside the cell, the calcium is low. And the actin sites are blocked by what's known as tropomyosin, and therefore the muscle is relaxed. Just to make sure you understand those. Low calcium, intracellular calcium is low, and the tropomyosin is blocking the actin binding. And this is what it's going to look like with activation, right? So a fully contracted sarcomere. You're thin, your actin slides past your thick. So they overlap to a significantly greater degree. And on the next slide, I'll show you what they look like side by side so you can kind of get a different view of it. Here you need to remember that your calcium is going to rush in. It's going to bind to troponin, which allows the tropomyosin to move away from the actin, and they bind. So once the, the site is unblocked, they can actually bind. Okay, so this is your kind of side-by-side -side view of the relaxed and contracted sarcomeres. Okay, so in your relaxed, your actin and myosin slightly overlap. And in the contracted sarcomere, the activation of the myosin cross bridges and the actin and myosin have a greater degree of overlap. So what you're seeing is that your thin filaments slide toward the center of the sarcomere. Your thick filaments are stationary. The myosin head attaches to the active site on the uh, actin, and it pulls the actin toward the center, and then detaches. We're going to talk about these steps more than once, and again, uh, go back and watch this as much as you need to. But the, these are the basic steps of contraction. Your um, details are coming next. so. We're going to talk about the basics here, and then we'll do this again. Okay, so step one, your nervous system stimulates the muscle fibers. Therefore, the myosin heads latch on to actin binding sites, and we get the cross bridge formation. The myosin head's going to pivot, pulling on the actin filament. You get ADP and P, so adenosine diphosphate and phosphorus released from the myosin head to form ATP. So ATP binding causes myosin to release from actin. The ADP and P, they provide energy to kind of recock the myosin head and it re, um, rebinds. So it's that repeat, right? You act like a ratchet where you kind of attach and then you do it again. Release, attach, release, attach, release. So it's essentially like the myosin is kind of walking down the actin, right? So like a ratchet, increasing the slide. So the attach and release is essentially um, ratcheting it in so you get that greater overlap. And you get simultaneously, as those cross bridge attachments are acting like a ratchet, you get the simultaneous muscle shortening. So the I bands decrease in length. Um, the distance between the Z's are decreasing, moving toward the M line, and the A bands get closer together. Okay. So one more time, the I bands decrease in length. So the distance between the Z's are decreasing, moving toward the M line, and those A bands get closer together. So steps two and three happen at the same time. Okay, so this should be in your book. You'll see that there are four, um, four parts. This is the overview of contraction. It gives you general sequence. Um, we're going to go into the details of each part, but this will be a really good reference for you, right? Parts one, two, three, and four, um, and kind of looking at these 
steps as kind of a sequence of events and the, and the basics of it. So we're going to walk through um, all of these pieces and, and we're going to start um, at the neuromuscular junction as it says. And I'm going to walk you through all of this. There's going to be a lot and I would suggest, again, start, stop, start, stop. But refer to your book and all these pieces are really written out in your book too. So it's pretty good. So here we are at the neuromuscular junction, and this is where part one is going to begin. And so this is the first baby step toward actually getting a contraction. So um, you can see some red numbers on here. Um, pay attention to those red numbers. They're very helpful, actually. Um, they're going to walk you through what I'm, what I'm talking about as well. Uh, so that's a good place to kind of follow along um, is with the numbers on the screen. So, um, step one, right, we have our action potential traveling along the axon of a motor neuron arriving at the axon terminal of the motor neuron. We get our um, conversion of our action potential into an actual chemical signal. Okay. Step two, we have voltage-gated calcium channels that are going to open. And then that's going to allow the calcium to enter the axon terminal, moving down the electrochemical gradient. Right, so the channel is going to open, there's going to be a rush in. That entry of that calcium, step three here, is going to cause acetylcholine, it's a neurotransmitter, to be released by exocytosis. So that's what you see happening in three. Okay. The calcium arrival causes acetylcholine to be released by exocytosis, and that acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the gap there, that synaptic cleft, and bind to ACH receptors on the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. This is known as depolarization. Okay. So you get this diffusion and receptor binding. Now we're at the muscle fiber. The muscle fiber is going to be depolarized. Step five, because of the binding, we open the chemically gated ion channels allowing sodium into the muscle fiber and calcium out. More sodium causes a local change called end plate potential. This is a wave of depolarization. At this point, we're in part two from your general uh, overview picture on the previous slide. Okay. So depolarization happens because we get um, the ACH arriving at the sarcolemma and we create this end plate potential. So we have more sodium starting this wave of depolarization. And that wave of depolarization is going to cause um, the action potential to be propagated in the muscle fiber at the sarcolemma. And that's what you see at six. And to finish up here, right, your ACH, your acetylcholine is then broken down in the synaptic cleft by an enzyme known as acetylcholine esterase, and it diffuses away from the junction. And this is really going to allow, this is an important step because it allows one contraction instead of continuous unstoppable contractions. Right, so the ACH arrives, triggers the next series of events, and then it gets broken down um, and diffuses away and is broken down and it's done. We're done. Okay. So this is the there's a lot going on here at the neuromuscular junction. So as we move into um, kind of part three from your general overview, right? We're here in the muscle. The acetylcholine has been broken down by acetylcholine esterase, and we have our action potential. Um, being propagated in the muscle fiber of the sarcolemma. So now we're kind of at step eight, even though this says six, it's kind of a mix, but when in my head I'm counting, but 
here we are on this picture, and we get your action potential in the sarcolemma traveling down the T tubule. That's what it's showing it step six over here. Right? The picture for step seven says that travel causes the shape change, and therefore calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it has a, a more detailed word there, but as long as you know it's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you're good. Okay? So the action potential traveling down the T-tubules causes the shape change. More calcium is released here, and um, we get that unlocking of um, the tropomyosin that's blocking the actin site. So now, with that arrival of calcium, we unblock the actin site, and we kind of move into step four, where contraction begins as that myosin binds to the actin, forming the cross bridge. And then if you kind of go back to our basics, right, we have the um, ratcheting, right, the cross bridge ratchets or walks down. Um, and we get what's called cross bridge cycling. So if, again, that goes back to your basics, where your ATP binding causes myosin to release, and then the ADP and P provide energy to recock that myosin head and rebind it again, right? So this is how that ratchet works, increasing the slide, and you get cross bridge cycling, okay? So exposed, so therefore attach, and your ATP and your ADP do their job to ratchet and create that contraction. Again, cross bridge cycling is what that is officially known as. So over those two slides, just kind of take a look. Um, if I followed them numerically as I spoke, there were 11 like key statements, right? So you had seven from the neuromuscular junction plus the four on excitation coupling. Um, so through the first seven was when we had that ACH broken down. And then we talk about the four parts um, that you saw in excitation coupling. Um, so kind of take a look and revisit it as you need to um, 11 statements. Uh, and watch it again and again. Okay, so here we are with calcium. And, and I talked about, talked about it a lot. So why is it important? Okay, at a relaxed state, your calcium is low in the sarcoplasm and high in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you have your troponin and your tropomyosin blocking the myosin and actin, so we're not contracting. Okay, so one more time, relax, low calcium in the sarcoplasm, high calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and your troponin and your tropomyosin we, we are blocking. Contracted, we get the increase of calcium in the sarcoplasm, which is going to move the tropomyosin off the actin binding site. Right? It's going to unlock the gate. It's going to let us do our thing. And therefore, then, in order to relax, that calcium has to be transported back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the troponin is going to re-block the myosin, and the tropomyosin, I'm sorry, the troponin is going to re-block the myosin, and the tropomyosin re-blocks the actin. Okay, so relaxed, myosin and actin are blocked, calcium is low in the sarcoplasm, high in the sarcoplasmic particulate. Contracted, the calcium increases in the sarcoplasm um, and allows um, the unblocking of our actin binding site. And then in order for the muscle to re-relax, or relax again, the calcium goes back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're working on going back to a state of low calcium in the sarcoplasm. The troponin blocks myosin, tropomyosin blocks actin. And we're back to where we started. So believe it or not, the principles for contraction of a single fiber and a large number of fibers are the same. The rules don't change, right? So here we have some definitions for the types of contraction that we need to um, have before we can get into those details. Um, we have muscle tension, which is the force exerted by a contracting muscle on an object. We have our load, which is the opposing force exerted on the muscle or muscles 
by the weight of the object. And we have a motor unit, which is the nerve muscle functional unit. One motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates or supplies is a motor unit. Okay. When a motor neuron fires, all of the innervated fibers contract. One nerve really could be 100, 150 fibers. Um, and um, for fine control, you're talking about small motor units. So it depends on if you want gross or fine movement. OK, so muscles work in an all or none response. Right, so if the threshold for contraction is released, the stimulated muscle fiber will maximally contract. Um, if you get an increased strength of contraction, it's going to be equal to increase of the fiber stimulated. So first up, we're going to talk about twitch. Twitch is that rapid contract and relax from a single electric stimulus. It has three phases. First up is our latent period. That's the very first few milliseconds in which the excitation contraction coupling is occurring. And we have the very beginning of cross bridge cycling. The period of contraction is when the cross bridges are active through our peak of tension. And then the period of relaxation is when we pump that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and contractile force declines. This whole thing is like 100 milliseconds. And so it's a tiny amount of time. You get the latent period, the first few milliseconds, you get your period of contraction, anywhere, you know, 10, 30, 40, whatever it is, milliseconds, based on what's going on. And then you get your period of relaxation. And that cross is kind of at most 100 milliseconds. If we were to create this in the lab, it would be a jerky movement. You would see a lab created jerky movement. Okay. And you're going to see that, that picture again on the bottom here. It's going to compare it to um, three other types of graded responses. Okay, so graded responses um, is the relatively smooth and various strength of properly controlled skeletal movement. You're going to see some things uh, in that picture that aren't necessarily helpful. They're not necessarily that smooth motion. So they're graded in two ways. You have the increased frequency causing temporal summation, or you have increased strength causing recruitment. Um, so for recruiting, we're talking about getting more motor units involved. So first up, we have temporal or wave summation. It's labeled wave summation in the picture. You, here what happens is you get a second rapid fire contraction, which is going to occur before relaxation. And the second one is greater um, because that muscle is already partially contracted. And um, you get these contractions added together. So you can see that in the bottom there, number two, wave summation. It's also known as temporal summation. Um, then you've got um, a picture there of an incomplete tetanus. This is when the degree of summation becomes greater and greater, becoming a sustained but kind of a quivering contraction. You can see a tiny little quiver, and then it releases. Um, so you're getting like a muscle, kind of like what we would call maybe more of a spasm, where it's contract, 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 and eventually it releases. Okay. A complete tetanus is the stimulation frequency increasing and the muscle tension increasing until maximum tension. Here, all the evidence of any sort of relaxation is gone, and the contraction spews into a smooth, sustained contraction plateau. Eek. Ouch. Right? Those are all under summation. Okay. So recruitment... Right, so recruitment where we're getting more motor units involved um, is also known as multiple motor unit summation. And here we're going to control the force of contraction more precisely as dictated by size principle. Okay, so we're getting um, more motor units involved dependent upon what we need to um, accomplish or, or do for that activity. 
All right, so here now we're going to talk about ATP. So ATP is needed to do three things. First, move or detach um, your cross bridges. You've got to operate the calcium pump in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and operate the sodium potassium pump in the plasma membrane. And it's a big job with only four to six seconds worth uh, of available ATP. So uh, regeneration of ATP is super essential. And we're gonna regenerate uh, in three different pathways, right? First, we have our direct phosphoryl phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate, creatine phosphate stored in the muscle. Um, and that gives you about 15 seconds. You have anaerobic glycolysis, which is the conversion of glucose to lactic, lactic acid, which we do that without oxygen. That gives you 30 to 40 seconds of energy. And we have our aerobic respiration. Um, so this is aerobic respiration of glucose, protein, or fat, creating tons of ATP. So the aerobic pathway, lots of ATP. The problem is it requires oxygen, but um, if we're using oxygen and we get this all going, we don't build up that lactic acid, so that's a plus. So those are our three pathways. Okay, so we have our energy systems, which are your aerobic um, and your anaerobic systems primarily. Um, so your aerobic endurance is the amount of time the muscle can continue to contract via the aerobic pathway. Um, here, if there's not enough oxygen, um, then oxygen debt is going to set in and um, lactic acid will accumulate the muscle fatigue. Um, so when you're not able to get oxygen enough to supply the muscle, um, you get that heavy feeling, that lactic acid buildup. Okay. We have our anaerobic threshold, um, and this is where we're talking about the point in which muscle metabolism converts to anaerobic glycolysis due to the unavailability of oxygen. Okay. Um, we are at an intensity level here where we can no longer make ATP aerobically and we're gonna get some muscle fatigue. Okay, so this is that physiological inability to contract. This isn't due to ATP depletion and it's also not due to lactic acid buildup but rather it's because our ATP use is outpacing our ATP production. We have, a, um, we have some changes here to our excitation coupling um, where you have decreased glycogen, you have potassium buildup in your um, extracellularly, you get a decrease in calcium release, which we know calcium is essential, um, and you get increased magnesium, which then further decreases your calcium availability. And so again, it's not because we have depletion or at lactic acid buildup, it's really because our use is out produ outpacing production. Okay, last but not least in this pretty hefty lecture, we get um, our factors affecting contraction. So the force of contraction depends on the number of cross bridges um, between actin and myosin, right? And there's four factors that are gonna deal with that. So you get your frequency of stimulation, so dealing with summation, your number of fibers recruited, so more motor units equals greater force. You have your size of your fibers. Bulkier fibers are gonna equal greater cross-sectional area, so there's more tension. And the degree of muscle stretch, and your tension is gonna vary with length. Velocity and duration of muscle contraction depend on the variety um, of the fiber type, the load, and the recruitment. And it's gonna depend on how fast and long the muscle can contract before fatiguing. Okay, so first up, let's talk about fiber type. Um, your speed or velocity of shortening depends on the fiber type. So we've got slow type one fibers, which are your endurance fibers. So you have increased capillaries, myoglobin, mitochondria, and aerobic enzyme, again, endurance. Then you have your type two fibers, which are your fast fibers. 
these are going to fatigue easily. You have increased glycogen and twitch rate, and you have decreased capillaries and myoglobin. And the type 2 are really your explosive activities. And then you have your type 2A, which are intermediate, um, and they are fast, but they have aerobic capacity or capability. So they're kind of a mix of fibers. Okay. Um, then you have load, and um, you get faster with no added load. So you have a greater load equals a longer latent period, slower shortening with um, more brief duration. And we have recruitment, which is more motor units contracting, so you get faster and more prolonged contraction. Okay, again, load. You go faster with no added load, so a greater load equals a longer latent period, slower shortening, and a more brief duration. Recruitment, you're going to add motor units, so you get faster and more prolonged contraction. And that's it. We've survived. Um, but again, I, you're going to want to watch this, um, and I'm going to um, try to get that Kahoot opened up for muscle contraction so that you can begin kind of looking over questions that could be asked. And it's just practice. It doesn't necessarily tell you everything. And now you're also ready to take the second of the two quizzes um, because that quiz over um, the um, muscle tissue required you to watch both of these lectures before you could take the quiz.